e tu mai, e tu mai, hei tiaki, hei manaki ki a tātou ka tāi mai, ki te whakapao ho me ki, ki te kaupapa o tarāne. Hei kapa me ti, e kaupapa whakaharahara, mana o te wai, te wai rere, te wai mana, te wai tangata, te wai kirunga kiraro. Nō rere koutou rei ngā mana e ngā reo, ngā karangara ngā tanga, hei whakapao ho atu koutou nei haranga mai, hei tautoko a ngā titoa ki a koutou katoa. Tai atu ki a koe, kei te minita, e mihi ana ki a koe, tai nui e waka, tāua, tāua, e mihi ana ki a koe, ka tāu mai ki a ngā titoa, tau whanaunga, e mihi kau atu ki a koe. Tai atu ki te deputy, the deputy sheriff, e mihi ana ki a koe tau, ko tāu mai kei wanga, lovely to have you with us this morning. Just want to extend in the language of my answers our privilege we are to welcome you here. This morning, all the delegates from different organisations, particularly from government, that has come to our wonderful setting here, please come back. Um, on behalf of our Iwi Ngāti Toa, it's really great to have our Minister, our Deputy, also Prime Minister here with us as well. Um, in saying that, nō rera koutou rā ki au kurangatira, ngā mea o te rohe nei, koutou rā, nau mai, haramai, whakatau mai rā. Tēnā koutou hara mai, tēnā koutou hara mai, tēnā koutou katoa. Tēnā koutou. Anō rera tēnā tātou katoa. Nō rera katoa au e mi atu ki a koe e te whanaunga e tūwhera te āhua tango o te wā. O tira, haere tunu ngā manākitanga ki runga ki a tātou e pai nei te nei wā. E mihi kauna ki te wahi ngaro, ki reira ngā mana atu i runga rawa, hei mana ki heitia ki te king e Māori a king e tu heitia me te whare kāhu i ariki. O tira, haere tonu ngā mana ki tanga ki runga, ki ngā whānau e noho paniana, e noho rawa koreana i tenei wā. Haere tonu tērā ngāngara o te korona, nō reira ke hikitia ngā toi mahatanga i runga i ngā whānau e noho mā wiwiana i roto i a rātou wā kainga. O tira katu au, he māngai o Waikato, Waikato tiwi tainui te waka, he mihi kauna ki a mātou whanaunga te mana whenua, te tau huhu o te whare manaki, he manaki hei tia ki a mātou, e huitahi nei i rungi tā hua tanga o tēnei kaupapa i mui a tātou. Nō reira haere tonu, haere tonu ngā mihi ki ngā minita, ai, ko ia te tangata, ko te tepiri dog, nō reira, ki a koe, E te primi a tuarua ki a koe, Grant, tēnei te mea tu ki a koe. O ti rā, ko te mea nui e mea tu ki aku whanaunga o Waikato, aha koa ko ia te minita, ko ia te whanaunga o mātou, nō reira kei konei a Waikato, hei manaki, hei tia ki te minita. Nā te mea, hea hai, ko au te awa, ko te awa ko au. Ko te rā te inga, Te kōrero e whakatakato i runga a Waikato, ko Waikato te iwi, ko Waikato te awa, nō reira e te mineta, tēnei te mea tu ki a koe, e kawea mai, tēnei taonga o ngā tūpuna, e whawhai rātou mō tēnei, nō reira ko tēnei te rā, whakahirahira mō rātou ngā tūpuna kangaro. Nō reira, o tira, kaore pahupau a haere te kōrero, nā te mea waiho tia te rā, pahupahu mō ngā mineta, I rungi i te aroha, i rungi i te rangi Māori, e mihi kauna ki a tātou katoa e pai nei. Mai waikato awa ki o koutou awa, mai taupiri maunga ki a koutou maunga, mai a mātou waka a tainui ki o koutou waka, nō reira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā rā tātou katoa. Nā whaka moe me te whaka whetai.
Torere nga mana e nga reo Kia tawi ho nga mana ki tanga o nga mana atu i runga I ta hua rahi tika, i ta hua rahi pai o a mātou kaupapa i tēnei rangi Ko tēnei te mi, ko tēnei te tono Tūturu awhiti waka maua kia tīna Haumie, huie, kai I wish to welcome you all here today. First, I'd like to acknowledge Minister Nanaia Mahuta, the Minister for Local Government, and Grant Robinson, the Minister for Infrastructure, the reason we're all here for today. I'd like to acknowledge Ngāri Toa, our mana whenua, with whom we have a great working relationship, Taku Parai, Helmut Modlik, Callum Kartini, Akamatua. My mayoral colleagues from around the region, Barbara Edmonds, our local MP, Greg O'Connor, the MP for Harrier and Chair of the Infrastructure Select Committee. Doug Martin, Chair of the Working Group on the Representative of Governance and Accountability. Lynn Carroll, the Chair of Wellington Water. And officials from both central and local government. I'm looking forward to the announcement about water reforms, but first I need to cover a few housekeeping rules. So in the event of emergency, Partaka Fire Wardens will escort you to the nearest exits. To my left is the Paramoana Street exit point. Please cross via the Rainbow Crossing and gather at the Harvey Norman car park. To my right is the Norrie Street exit. Please exit via the main doors and follow the path to the skate park. If there's an earthquake, you know what to do. Drop cover and hold. The public toilets are located to my right, just past the Kaizen Cafe. The Partick staff are here to assist you with any questions. But now it is with my great pleasure that I ask Minister Mahuta to speak. E rere ana ngā mihi ki a toa rangatira koutou e pupuri ana i te mano o ngēnei whenua ta tuatura ki ngā Māori o ngā wai. Tēnā koutou. Kei tēnei peka o te whanga o nui a Tarakatika, te whakahoki i ngā mihi ki a koutou, kei tērā atu taha te atia wafānui me ngā iwi e pai nei. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you all for coming to hear this important update on the Three Waters Reform Program. I'd also like to thank Porirua City Council and Mayor Anita Baker for hosting us today and for her kind words of introduction. As a council has, who has ongoing demands with meeting Three Waters infrastructure requirements, Porirua City knows all too well the importance of this reform. I want to acknowledge the local government leaders here today, representatives of Mana Whenua, our partners in the water sector and others. I'd also like to acknowledge and introduce my colleague Infrastructure Minister Grant Robertson, who is leading the significant challenge of ensuring that we're better prepared for the future when we have an active government leading a strategic approach to integrated infrastructure planning and financing. On that note, I want to acknowledge local MPs, Barbara Edmonds and also Greg O'Connor. Thanks for being here. We'll jointly update you on Cabinet's response to the recommendations of the Independent Working Group on Representation, governance and accountability, and to outline the next steps in implementing the government's decisions. But first, a couple of thank yous. Speaking directly to all local government and iwi leaders around the motu, I want to offer the government's acknowledgement of your leadership for the important role you've played for decades as the custodians of the water services and promoting water quality, which we all depend on. It's also important to reassert the government's thanks to the working group for the robust feedback and sensible, well-considered recommendations that tackled the issues of most concern for councils as we progress the reform. Community connection to local infrastructure, ensuring local voice is evident in, decision, in decisions impacting on communities, and strengthened governance oversight measures are key aspects that the working group were tasked with addressing. This sat alongside feedback from local government on the broader aspects of Three Waters reform following years of consultation. The working group tasked itself by moving beyond parochial interests and working constructively together with community interests in mind, and I thank you for doing that. We welcome the consideration framing the range of suggestions to improve governance, 
representation and local voice. We've listened to those ideas and considered all of the suggestions. Today, I'm pleased to announce that Cabinet has listened to the advice of the working group and accepted the majority of the working group's recommendations in full. This will strengthen local voice and confirms council ownership. Of the 47 recommendations, the government agrees to 44 in full, partially and in principle, with three that need to be worked on further. We've listened and amended accordingly. We've strengthened protections that ensure local, locals will always have a strong say in the delivery and the management of their water. And we've locked in even more strongly public ownership of the new water service entities through a shareholding model, providing councils with a tangible measure of ownership and connection to significant water infrastructure in their communities. We're now in the best position possible to move forward with the reforms. And I underpin that. We need to move forward. We cannot keep looking backwards. New Zealanders have the right to expect that when they turn on the tap, the water that comes out will be clean, safe, reliable, and won't make them sick. In a developed country like ours, it should go without saying that our storm and wastewater services are resilient and robust enough to keep our communities safe and to support them to grow and prosper. That is a clear expectation that we all have, every one of us. Unfortunately, we're not delivering on this expectation at the moment and we need to get to that point to ensure the future resilience of every community across the country. Since the Havelock North tragedy, in fact since well before then, there's been widespread agreement that there needs to be reform. As the working group found, everyone they heard from agrees that the status quo is unacceptable. It is time to move forward which we must and will do. Today's announcement is a significant milestone for these reforms. The government is focused on delivering the changes that are needed by progressing legislation to establish new water service entities. There will be further opportunity for the public to have their say through the submission process on this legislation. I want to take a moment to address the issues of public ownership and joint oversight of the four new water entities. Public ownership of the four water entities is and has always been a bottom line for our government. The reforms outline a two-layered governance structure for the water service entities that maintains public ownership and ensures local government and iwi Māori participation and voice at the strategic level on the regional representative groups. The working group recommendations which we accept strengthen that model. We maintain that the direct management of and operational oversight of the water entities will be undertaken by a board appointed solely on the basis of its skills and expertise. Appointments to the water service entities boards will be based on professional skills and competency. And I've said that right from the beginning, that's what's required. We've consistently ruled out co-governance at this level because we do know the scale of the challenge in front of these entities. Joint strategic oversight with local government and iwi Māori will only happen at the regional representative group level, which exists to hold the boards to account for delivering better outcomes for communities. This ensures the delivery of water services remains anchored in our evolving systems of local democracy. It is at this regional oversight level where the long-term impacts of water services are worked through and its strategic objectives set for the intergenerational benefit of communities and the environment. But beyond that, the enduring nature of the relationship between councils and mana whenua will set in place a more fertile and productive space for making decisions reflecting the well-being of their communities people and environment now and into the future. I know that Iwi Māori will participate at this level and this is the best place for that kind of approach. Joint decision making, shared aspirations, focusing on broader community objectives. Māori have a long-term interest in the sustainability and modi of water. In fact, just this morning we went out to visit 
a, a, a wetland here in Porirua and heard many other initiatives about how nature-based solutions and working with the land can improve community outcomes. That's the kind of future we want to see everywhere around the country. By extension, enduring public ownership of our water entities protects water and the public interest in these significant assets. The Crown has treaty obligations to meet, which is why we support the working group's suggestions to strengthen oversight at the regional level. But I want to be clear that ownership of the entities themselves will remain with councils alone through a shareholding model that is directly proportional to the size of council populations. Each council will get one share per 500,000 per 50,000 people. I better get that right. <laughs> Rounded up, and this approach was supported by mana whenua representatives on the working group. The thing to remember here is that many councils said we will miss out in this aggregation of council interests. No, you will not. That's been reflected by the working group, and I thank them for the helpful suggestion. Finally, to reinforce our bottom lines of public ownership, I've written to all political parties in Parliament to seek cross-party support for the continued public ownership of the four new water service entities and protection against possible sale of those critical lifeline assets. As I've said before, we can't do this without you. I look forward to continuing to work with the local government and water sectors and with Iwi Māori in the coming years to ensure Aotearoa is clean, safe, reliable drinking water. We all need and deserve. We need better environmental outcomes, more resilient waters infrastructure, affordability for those services to ratepayers, and leverage benefits for financing infrastructure. All of this underpins what we so desperately seek, which was to make our local communities livable and to continue to improve wellbeing on their behalf. I'll hand over now to the Minister for Infrastructure, Grant Robertson. Wahi mihi ana na mana whenua ki tēnei rohi nā te toa a rangatira tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou kātoa. E na mana e na reo rau rangatira mā ana hoe whā, no mai haere mai. Anita, thank you too for your warm welcome. I want to acknowledge my parliamentary colleagues, Barbara Edmonds and Greg O'Connor, all of the distinguished leaders of local government, they're literally all here um, today, and um, that's reflective, I think, of the importance of the decision that we're making today. Uh, representatives of agencies and communities, and as I say, mana whenua ngāti tōa rangatira, thank you uh, for being here. I want to start by acknowledging uh, my colleague, uh, the Honourable Nanaia Mahuta. Nanaia, your leadership on this issue has been exceptional. Dealing with issues as significant as this was always going to give rise to difficult conversations and to disagreements, and your commitment to getting a solution that achieves our goals and takes communities with us has been incredible. Namahi nui ki akwe. Today marks an important day for New Zealand's water infrastructure. I too want to offer my personal thanks to the working group for the sensible and practical recommendations that you have made. You have deeply and respectfully considered suggestions and alternatives put forward by local government, by iwi Māori colleagues, and listened to their concerns. And we, as a government, in turn, have listened and taken on board the vast bulk of your recommendations. The recommendations have made the reform programme better. Reforms of this scale are always better when we work together to share knowledge and listen to each other's expertise and experiences. So again, thank you. I agree with the Minister. This is an absolutely critical infrastructure project and programme, and we are now in the best possible position to move forward, and that is what we are going to do. New Zealand has spent more than 20 years getting to this point, and as the working group itself made clear, we cannot afford for it to take another 20 years. For too long, the can has been kicked down the road on water infrastructure and water quality. The easy thing for our government to have done was to let the status quo continue. But in this case, the easy thing is not the right thing. 
Three waters is one of New Zealand's biggest infrastructure challenges, and we need to get it right. I am confident that the proposed structures will provide the ability to raise the capital required. It will also be affordable for ratepayers and deliver us the safe and clean water we all expect. The costs to our health and our communities and to our ratepayers are too high to not get this done. And fundamentally, these reforms are about infrastructure. They are cost-effective and safe water infrastructure that's strong enough to keep up with the pace of growth and change in New Zealand. Infrastructure capable of protecting the health and well-being of our people and environment through safe drinking water and clean waterways. Infrastructure that enables the building of new homes and communities and for our country to grow and prosper as we deal with the challenges of climate change. This progress is what is at stake in these reforms. We all agree that New Zealand is facing extraordinary challenges with maintenance and upgrades of our water infrastructure. Without reform, households are facing water costs of up to $9,000 per year or the prospect of services that fail to meet the needs of their communities. The Three Waters reform provides the scale and access to finance needed to address decades of underinvestment in our water infrastructure and to build the networks that we need for the future. Underinvestment has led to unacceptable situations in a developed country like ours. Pipes regularly bursting onto our major city streets, sewage flowing into our waterways, and half a million New Zealanders each year forced to boil their water because of faecal contamination. We have to do better. Our government has bottom lines for this reform. These are that the entities remain in public ownership. We retain balance sheet separation. We give effect to the treaty and ensure good governance and board selection processes. The working group's recommendations have, that we have accepted further strengthen those bottom lines. The public shareholding structure that the minister just announced makes community ownership clear with shares held by councils on behalf of their communities. It also further strengthens local voice and participation in water service delivery. At the operational level, this is conducted by board members who are, will be appointed for their expertise and their skills in water service delivery. At the strategic regional representative level, councils and iwi Māori can reflect the long-term aspirations of their communities. To reiterate again, there are no co-governance arrangements at the operational board level. At the regional level, there will be shared strategic planning between councils and iwi Māori. As well as ensuring the board's decisions reflect community interests, it also provides certainty for New Zealanders who were worried that this could be another asset sale. We are protecting public ownership. Iwi Māori have never expressed a wish to sell water assets, and they bring an intergenerational, long-term lens to issues relating to water in their area. Having their participation alongside councils at the strategic level gives further safeguards that water assets will not be sold off. In light of some of the comment that has been made about these arrangements, I'm struck by the fact that through this working group process, the vast bulk of councils have accepted and indeed wanted a co-governance arrangement. That's because councils are used to it in their own work and understand its value. In turn, iwi on the working group were supportive of the clarity of council ownership of the assets on behalf of their communities. These arrangements, improved as they have been by the working group process, represent what I believe is a practical and a very Aotearoa New Zealand consensus. This is an exciting time. We need to fix water infrastructure. We need to ensure that New Zealanders are healthier and safer today and build the foundations for the future. We need to unlock the potential of our cities, our towns and our rural communities to grow and prosper. And we need to ensure we're resilient in the face of climate change. Only a program as significant as Three Waters can take us in that direction. I thank the working group again, and I thank all of you for coming today. And I now will hand over to Mayor Anita Baker to say a few words. Kia ora koutou.
th thank you both. Before I say anything, I'm actually handing over to Helmut um, from uh, Ngāti Tawa, the chair of um, our local iwi. Helmut. I, I haven't been promoted. I'm still just the CEO. <laughs> I uh, I've just been reflecting as I've been listening to the uh, speakers. Uh, if you just turn to my left, you're right over here. You'll see over here this punga kofa, which is an ancient artifact which was recovered from the harbour of Purirua. It's about a thousand years old. And the history of that punga is that it was left here by Kupe. Anyone who doesn't know who Kupe is, you're in the wrong place. Uh, he left that here. And if you go and have a look at it, it's actually got signs of its man-made nature. And, and there is a story behind it. It's a thousand years old. Behind these walls uh, is a display of Taong of Ngāti Toa, uh, mere, mere Paunamu, Taiaha and other treasures that were wielded by uh, men and women who were in this place famous, their ancestors of ours, uh, as they arrived and, and lived down here some 200 years ago. My reflections about the, uh, the longevity of our interest and our place uh, as people uh, in this land and in this particular place I hope is to give some context to what it is we're doing here today. Uh, all of us who are here spe uh, listening and participating in this, we're, we're only, <coughs> excuse me, we're only temporary stewards for a brief time. And I would like to extend my sincere uh, thanks on behalf of Ngāti Tōa to the leadership, two of whom we've heard from this morning, who for their brief time of stewardship have taken the courageous decision to act on behalf of all of our land, all of our people, to do something concrete to improve it for the generations to come. And so, uh, if you go outside the doors over here on the right, if, if you were inclined, you could throw a stone and it would land in our, our harbour. Uh, I mentioned our people coming here 200 years ago, and for the vast majority of that time, it was the food basket for Ngāti Tōa, quite literally. As Manuhiri would come here, uh, the young ones would be sent down to gather up some kai, bring it over to feed the Manuhiri. It's only slightly been more than my lifetime that it's been changed from a food basket to a pond, where, while still beautiful on a sunny day as it is today, there's no more eating. You sure as heck better not be swimming in it or you'll regret it. And that is a travesty. We didn't do it. I don't think anyone in the room did it. All we can do, Fano, is deal with our day, our time. And again, I'd like to acknowledge and thank our leadership, and not just our central government leadership, but all around the Mutu who've had the wisdom to get in behind this initiative to create and to provide for our moko and our moko's moko's. Uh, a regenerated place to live in where they will once again be able to eat and swim and drink and enjoy this beautiful place that is our birthright. I guess just to conclude, things don't change by definition until they do. And uh, change is always a challenge. It always creates, again, by definition, some discomfort for those who are uh, enjoying the status quo. Ngāti Tō doesn't care who owns the infrastructure. We only care that our environment and our water and our people have the health that is uh, our obligation to provide for them and to improve. So for the third time, ngā mihi atu kia kōrua, ki koutou katoa, because I know a lot of people have had a hand in, in uh, bringing about what is about to happen. Kia kaha, kia manawa nui,
Thank you, Helmut. From Council's point of view, we are honoured to host ministers for an announcement of such great public interest. When Minister Mahuta first unveiled her plans for reforms and the management and government arrangements relating to the Three Waters, Porirua City Council took it very seriously, the task of evaluating the proposal against the city's current and future needs. We did so by first start, starting along a hard and what would seem status quo. It was a wake-up call. We found ourselves looking down the barrel of a huge infrastructure bill over the coming years. We knew change had to come. We, were going, we couldn't maintain our water quality, our infrastructure and our services to the level our residents had every right to demand and expect. We're talking hundreds of millions in future financial investment. We therefore renew, reviewed the Minister's proposal, not in isolation, but in context of what we know is an unsustainable status quo. Minister Mahuta, you and your colleagues deserve our thanks for this proposal that comprehensively overhauls the way we manage our most precious resource, water. And thank you for listening to the sector's concerns and making these important government changes. Establishing a new regime which creates much larger, more financial robust water entities is a necessary change. It means governments and management will be fit for purpose and built to a scale to for the task. Does it bring re risk? Yes, of course it does, but we face risk anyway. That's why our council has said from the outset that these changes make a ton of sense for Porirua. We look forward to working with you, Minister, and your officials as we move to the transition date of 1 July 2024. So thank you. That brings us to the end. Um, our friends from the press can go down into the Helen Smith room and the ministers and whoever you are asking to go down there will come down to you. Everybody else has got tea and coffee here, so uh, thank you all for attending. I want, to th I want to thank the Minister for Infrastructure uh, for partnering the progression of this uh, significant piece of work uh, because Three Waters does not sit isolated from other aspects of the infrastructure challenge that we have before us. Um, yeah, and look, I just want to add, uh, as I said in my comments out there now, my thanks to Minister Mahuta. This is you know, one of the most significant infrastructure programmes that will be overseen or at least started in our political lifetimes and uh, the Minister alongside uh, local government and iwi have I think done a tremendous job. I also want to reiterate our thanks to uh, local government representatives who are here, those who are on the working group, uh, local government New Zealand, like Noel Stewart um, here today as well, um, and also iwi representatives with um, Helmut um, representing Ngāti Tōr today, but also the officials, which I don't, we don't always get a chance to do. Um, this is an enormous programme and Minister Mahuda's DIA officials, uh, those working in MB Treasury and elsewhere, have done an exceptional job of getting us to this point. We're by no means at the end, uh, but it is a, it's an historic day. Look, today represents a significant turning point in terms of moving forward to progress uh, the Three Waters programme based on eight weeks of consultation with the sector, the government taking on board what were the most important issues that were highlighted by councils, which was governance, representation and local voice, then implementing a working group, uh, and the working group has since provided its recommendations. So I think we're at a point now where we can just say it's important to move forward, and uh, we've taken on board, to the greatest extent possible, the most significant concerns of the sector. Well, we've got 24 councils in this dissident program. Auckland isn't exactly on board either. That's what at least half the population. You really have a mandate for this. 
What we have is a general acknowledgement from across the whole sector, even those 24 councils, that the status quo is not acceptable and that change needs to happen. And if, if I consider uh, some of the initiatives that have been provided uh, by uh, the 24 councils, they're initiatives that have already been considered. It's in our, uh, our RIS in terms of the way in which we've considered, for example, a council controlled uh, organisation type model scaled up uh, and I think we've, we've definitely responded to the range of issues that they've raised and also the governance working group had heard their concerns as well. I'd also say, just, so I'll just follow up on that Brian, that I'd also say that the mandate we have is from New Zealanders and that's to make sure that they have clean drinking water and that their sewage and stormwater systems work properly and the status quo as the Minister has indicated is not providing that. Uh, because everybody agrees something needs to be done but then can't quite agree on exactly what that is, is not a reason to stand still. Uh, we have consulted thoroughly, uh, we have listened, we have made changes, but New Zealanders deserve us to get on with it. Minister, will there be an opportunity for councils to go into co-governance arrangements further down the track? I think when we consider the recommendations that the government are progressing, uh, at the regional representative group level there is an opportunity absolutely for co-governance to exist. Um, the working group made a recommendation, for example, that there should be co-chairs. We've said actually that should be a matter for the entities to decide within the context of their constitution. So at that oversight level, yes, there is an opportunity. But at that, regional, but at that, at that governance level, though, at that entity level, will there be an opportunity further down the track for co-governance? What we need is for the entities of that scale and size to have pre professional uh, skills-based elected members who are able to undertake the significant challenge of running those entities. Now, that's been well cast uh, and foreshadowed to not only councils but iwi mana whenua. And the strongest role that iwi mana whenua can play is at the strategic level through the regional representative group and then dropping down under that, the sub-regional groups, because that will take a number of these strategic decisions decisions closer back to community to enable the types of outcomes that communities are want saying, to see. Are you saying that skill and expertise couldn't be achieved through mana whenua? I'm saying that skill and expertise is an absolute prerequisite and within that, for example, consideration around uh, knowledge of the Treaty of Waitangi and obligations thereof and, and there's ways of achieving that. We do that on a number of other boards. One at a time. <laughs> You've talked about the anxiety around this change. That's a really strong word to use. Did the government create that anxiety? Actually, the anxiety would have been long-standing. We've had 20 years of underinvestment in waters infrastructure, and that anxiety has probably translated to local communities as a deep sense of frustration, burst pipes, you know, uh, after a big storm event, uh, sewage seeping into waterways and, and coastal areas. Um, but there is always anxiety around change, and I acknowledge that. And so we've continued to work with councils, uh, with their representative bodies, to ensure that the uh, most, uh, I guess, concerning of those issues have been addressed throughout the progression of this reform. So how much, how much, how much... Are you satisfied with the public's level of public understanding about the reform? And will we be doing another comms campaign? I think we've got to continue to educate the public about the benefits of a reform like this. This isn't straightforward, it's very complex. And to some extent, if you took a public sentiment measure, what they want a surety of is that when they turn on the tap, they've got clean, healthy drinking water and it's not brown water coming out, it's not contaminated. They also want the surety that their natural environment isn't being impacted on because we've got failing wastewater treatment plants uh, and we've got, after a major storm event, again, sewage seeping into their waterways. That's the kind of a surety that they want.
In terms of knowledge of how these reforms work, I think the other assurity will be around ongoing affordability measures, and that's a, quite a key consideration for the government. So, so how, 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 because there was never a co-government's requirement for themselves, and, and there was never a co-government's requirement operationally in the water it looks like the co-governance at the level of the regional representative groups is the same as it always was. Has anything changed there? Uh, there's been strengthened recommendations from the governance working group around co-governance arrangements in relation to the setting of strategic documents. For example, strategic performance expectations and how that's set, how that takes account of te mana o te wai. Again, the governance right. working group uh, strengthened those aspects and also uh, by ensuring that sub-regional groups were established to take decision making more close, closer to communities and again continuing to involve Māori so at that level. Those documents come from the regional representative groups which are co-governed? Yes. yes. So, so there is still co-governance in the system and it's just not the board or... That's right. Yes. And that has always been the case? Well, what, certainly from our perspective we've always understood that the best place for the co-governance arrangements to have their greatest impact was at the strategic and regional level. It would be fair to say that not all of the uh, coverage or all of the understanding has been as clear as that, Thomas. So that's one of the reasons we've made that clear today. So you're just clarifying there has been a misconception that the boards and the FCs are entirely co-governed from tips, so... I think when people have applied the term co-governance in this particular situation, some people have chosen to make that sound like it's at the operational level of uh, these entities. It's not. Uh, as the Minister says, the working group have strengthened the way that the regional representative groups will work in, in a co-governance way. So I think it is important to be clear about that. How much How investment... Are the entities going to be funded to get off the ground? I beg your pardon? How are the entities going to be funded to get off the ground? So they, they will have sufficient working capital by aggregating up the assets that all the individual councils have. Uh, it's our estimate that they will be able, as a result of that, to borrow at about six to eight times the rate that the individual entities would be able to do. We're now finalising that capital structure, but they will certainly have the ability to have the working capital they need uh, to kick things off. So how much, how much extra capital do you think? I'll just take both, because I think they're the same question. Was that better off support package a bribe to the council? Well, no, what the Better Off Support Package was, was to make sure that we worked with councils in what is a significant transition for their balance sheets. Um, while arguably not every part of the three water system was an asset for a council, for some of them it was certainly a liability, uh, that is still a significant change to their balance sheets. We wanted to recognise that. That also follows on from funding that was directly towards support for three waters, some of which we were looking at today. So, so, <laughs> so, so how much um, extra investment could these new structures unlock over the next 10 to 20 years? Oh, it's significant. I can't give you a specific number today. It's one of the things that we're working through. But obviously we've recognised uh, a deficit of infrastructure of, of north of 150 billion, 180 billion. We believe we can start to unlock significant parts of what's needed to invest there. Once we get the assets aggregated together, we can have a full picture of, of the value of them um, and obviously the ability, as I said before, to borrow against them, which in their estimate from June I think was around six to eight times. So, so how, how much extra uh, will people be paying in water charges? in areas where the water charges will be put in by the new authorities? Well, obviously those decisions are far into the future in terms of the establishment of the entities. There are, and you know, as I said, the ability that those councils have, sorry, that the entities have to borrow means that they can do a significant amount of the work that they need to do. Um, the exact way in which entities will look at other revenue streams is much further down the track. Yeah, can, can, I just, can I just add uh, a small point? Uh, the water service entities will need to get really good information about the state and health of the infrastructure network and actually the priority will be around leakage uh, because what we do know especially in small communities where there hasn't been the ability to get a full to get full visibility around the state of health leakage would be a precursor to any any decisions around uh, water charging so just to, just to be just to be sure um, the the uh, councils and the strategic um, boards won't be in a position to stop water charges if those authorities decide on them? I think, well, what, what I would say is that the way in which councils will uh, want to ensure that the water service entities are operating to the greatest uh, value back to the community and at an economic efficiency level that can improve the infrastructure network 
many councils, many regions will have to look at the issue of leakage and look at the significant investment challenge there before any conversation around volumetric charging. And also, and also just to, to add to that, obviously this is the whole point of the regional representative group model, is that the councils not only are appointing the boards, they're also helping set the strategic intent and direction. Through that process, councils, EWI will be able to inform the way that the entities operate. So, you know, there is a significant role for councils to influence the way in which they go about that work. But as the Minister indicates, there's an awful lot to do before anyone would be needing to consider those sorts of things. And the, and the only exception to that, Bernard, as you're aware, is Auckland with water care. Minister, you had said that the women upscale CCA. Why does the government reject the recommendation to continue to provide ongoing well, the situation is that the, as the whole point of this is to aggregate up the assets that are there. And we believe that once we do that, they'll certainly have the working capital they need to get on with the job of improving water infrastructure. That's the very point of the exercise. And one of the reasons we work so hard to make sure that balance sheet separation continued is because that's what enables the entities to borrow and be able to you know, achieve a much greater level of debt financing than any individual council could. So and this, is, this, is, this, is, this is an area where we have to continue to ensure that councils have uh, a clear understanding of uh, balance sheet separation because the solution and the model that we're moving to will mean uh, that uh, the debt will not be sitting on the council books nor the government books. In fact, they'll be residing within the context of the water service entity. So, so the borrowing the entities were an upscale CCO, Aucklanders and particularly Iwi and Tamaki would say that CCOs are an abject failure. They've distanced themselves from EWI and from the councils. How can you ensure that these entities won't do the same? No, you may have misunderstood what was being said. What, was, what, what, what we did was consider at a very early stage, a CCO type model which wouldn't work, uh, primarily because it would create inequities region by region and also it wouldn't achieve uh, the, balance sheet sep sep the balance sheet separation that is required in order to fund the scale of investment needed uh, in this area. So what we've done is proposed the creation of four standalone water service entities to be able to achieve scale and to leverage through debt financing the ability to invest in infrastructure. Just one, one quick question of how much households have to pay depends partly on the economic regulation that has to be put in place there. How is that um, process going? Because these will after all be natural monopolies. Yeah, that's right. And there is a, a whole work stream on economic regulation. In fact, Minister Mahuda and I spent a fair part of a morning this week working through that. It's not yet finalised, but it's not uh, far away. And you're absolutely right, if you look at these models around the world, um, the economic regulator plays a very significant role. Through the economic regulator you can also look at consumer protection measures, you can look at equity measures to be able to make sure that we, we continue to support all New Zealanders to have access to safe, reliable water. And so the fact that we've got four water service entities allows domestic benchmarking of performance between the entities. So, so, so we we'll be able to get... Oh, we, we're continually doing that, and throughout this process, actually, the working group have been talking to Standard and Poor's um, around, you know, what arrangements we might have and how that might affect the ability to do that debt financing. I'm very confident that we will be in a position to be in that ballpark, whether it's exactly that number or not will obviously depend as we do the final analysis. And it is important, as the Minister said uh, earlier today, we now go into the process of finalising the drafting of the legislation. That legislation then comes before Parliament. The public then have the opportunity to have another look at it there. And we'll continue our conversation with the rating agencies to make sure we're still in the strong position we're in now. So will this be able to be reversed by a new government? Because the second piece of legislation is not going to be in before the election, is it? We hope not. And we, in fact, we're doing everything we can to progress this type of reform because it's been an issue that's languished for far too long. We're not prepared to kick the can down the road. And as uh, Minister of Infrastructure has said, uh, we are taking on a really significant, difficult challenge because if we don't, 
communities will pay more and they can ill afford to do that. But more importantly, we know with the challenge of climate change, more significant weather events, that we are going to get uh, and see issues of stormwater flood um, taking waste into our waterways. So, uh, look, that's why we believe that Parliament should be supporting the type of reform that we're proposing so that there's longer resilience and, and in our infrastructure. And I would say, for some of our political opponents, here's the time to step up if you believe in public ownership. Um, we've heard certainly from, from the National Party that they, throughout this process, have been concerned about the loss of ownership in communities. Well, we've dealt with that today thanks to the Working Group's recommendations. Now they can step up and say, yeah, we will agree that these assets won't be sold. I think that's actually important for New Zealanders to hear that. They can take it from the Labor Party. We'll do everything we can to make sure that these stay in public ownership, but ultimately our political opponents have to stand on whatever they believe in. And on that, and well, it's a lofty dream, though, isn't it? I mean, both of those act and national have campaigned on, on, not, on scrapping an axe roof without a press release, saying three waters would go. Um, well, again, I just invite, um, I'm perhaps not too surprised to hear that from the ACT Party, but I, I invite um, our political opponents to firstly say what they would actually do instead of this to make sure New Zealanders have clean drinking water and that our waste and stormwater systems work properly. But secondly, I've heard a lot of rhetoric from the National Party about public ownership and community ownership over the course of the last year or two. Now's the time to step up. The Minister's written to all the parties in Parliament saying, we, the Labour Party, believe in public ownership. Do you? We await their answer. So but we're not going to. We can't leave it to chance. You asked an earlier question about public education, and we can't divorce what ratepayers want to see in their communities now and going forward into the future. And that's why it's so important that they get good information, not misinformation, and that they are very clear about the beneficial advantage to them as ratepayers to the community, but also to the environment. And that's, we're committed to doing that. So, so how much of it, how much of it? national spread misinformation? I think nationals uh, made politics on this and we don't want to. We know that pu public, a public ownership model is important for all New Zealanders. It will give them assurance. And we also know that there is opportunity to leverage from scale uh, through aggregation for the long-term investment in water infrastructure that creates a more resilient... How, how much of a role does this uh, water investment play in, in housing, um, growing the number of houses? Well, oh, vitally important, and, and you know, if you think about some of the announcements that we've made just even in the last 24 hours up in Auckland with uh, the large-scale projects up there, we have to have good quality water infrastructure to back up the kind of urban development that we want. And um, we were just having this conversation when we were at uh, we we're at the wetland earlier today that there's two large-scale developments in this area that are being assisted by that housing acceleration fund, and we have to integrate the way we manage water into those projects. So it's essential that we get this change at the same time as we do that big urban infrastructure. Kotetino <laughs> You know, uh, Kari hit me a point more than I find a kid. So, when you talked about misinformation, what was the most important piece, bit of misinformation that you felt had to be dispelled? Well, first, in ensuring that people are aware that the government's bottom lines protect the public interest. A public ownership model safeguarding against privatisation, making drinking water the absolute focus for these reforms because we've got to remember the Havelock North inquiry and the fact that while it was focused in Havelock, these issues could be occur anywhere across any community. So drinking water is an absolute, uh, um, I guess, obligation uh, in terms of outcomes of the reform. And actually, that having 67 councils deliver water services is not the most efficient thing to do. So we need to find a different way. So, so will the debt financing um, being used um, be counted as uh, core Crown debt and therefore um, be part of the fiscal rules, or is it a way to essentially uh, um, you know, not have that debt uh, be um, part of those? Or, as has already been stated, the, it's off both central and local government balance sheet. However, it's got nothing to do with fiscal rules or anything like that, and I'll be talking about those next week. Has there been an entrenching provision before in your political career? It's quite an unusual tactic, right? 
Minister Hoon's been around for a longer time. I, I have Renault, Renault's had his bill. Yeah, 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 he has. I mean, look, this, the, the step that we are taking is very bespoke to the challenge in New Zealand. And while it might uh, be an unusual step, it, it's actually for the right, it's based on the right principle. A public ownership model that safeguards against privatisation that gives every citizen, Māori Pākehā alike, the absolute assurance that the direction of travel has to protect their opportunity now and into the future around safe drinking water, better environmental outcomes, a financially sustainable model of investing in the significant infrastructure cost looming. The Nationals just put out a press release saying that they would not uh, privatise it. They haven't said whether or not they'd like your entrenching provision. Um, you know, Deeds, not words, <laughs> is what I would say. <laughs> Actions must follow words. What do you say to ratepayers who may be listening to the fact that these new entities can borrow up to six to eight times more money and will need to do this big investment to you know, renew all of the infrastructure and that, that their you know, water bills won't be going up astronomically because of it? Well, well actually, well, there's, there's a few things that follow from having the, the assurance that these entities can invest in the significant costs going forward. They can forecast over a longer period of time rather than through the annual plans and the, and the planning cycle of council elections because things change. So they've got a longer horizon of certainty around giving a signal to communities around investment, smarter procurement practices, which is always going to make a difference. And then in terms of affordability measures, the role of the economic regulator will make a critical impact on ensuring that the pricing of um, costs for infrastructure investment and the benefits back to ratepayers can be assured. I'd say that they, I'd say for ratepayers, there's two <coughs> other options to what we're talking about today. One is that the status quo carries on, and they have more examples of not being able to drink the water that comes out of their tap. More examples of sewage pipes bursting. More example of flooding because stormwater systems are not good or their individual council has to try to address these issues which would cost them as a ratepayer a great deal more than it will cost these larger aggregated entities. So we accept the fact that this is a massive job, but the way to do it, the other two ways of doing it, simply would make life worse for ratepayers. The research that went into it, right, suggested yeah. that it would result in cheaper hmm. water bills for, for, for you know, homeowners that's right, and that's exactly the point of doing the exercise, is to make sure that it is cheaper for ratepayers. The work has to be done. The alternative of not doing the work we hear from everybody is no longer acceptable. To us, this aggregation model will mean it is cheaper for the consumers of water, but we've got to do the work now to build those entities up to be able to deliver on that promise. And the final, and the final piece of the puzzle will be creating the economic regulator and their role and function across the system will help give assurance around those benefits. We'll, we'll just be take a couple more. Before. Just wouldn't be fair to say that the message from Standard & Poor's is if you want to be able to borrow all this money at decent interest rates, the revenue supporting that debt can't be at the mercy of local body politicians with the particular electoral incentives that they have. I think, I think the way they would, <laughs> I think the way that they would phrase it, uh, Brian, would be to say that you need balance sheet separation, and balance sheet separation through a CCO model has not proved to be a sufficient balance sheet separation, as opposed to the creation of entirely new entities. So that's the way that they look at it. Does that mean water charges are Last pretty much inevitable, like household water charges, or is there a chance that, that the entities will build councils which will still? Look, I think it's a premature question, and I think uh, it's important to ensure uh, that we f uh, enable the process of developing, for example, the full suite of proposals under economic regulation, which, under which that, those types of issues are being considered before we jump out and, and make comments but in that area. But you won't be able to do demand management without pricing. Well, that, that's one of the questions that the entities will get to. The point that's been made here is that in establishing these, they will have the aggregated assets of the councils within them, they will have the working capital they need, they will have the borrowing headroom that they need to be able to get going on this. As the Minister indicates, the economic regulation model that will govern that is the next step. We'll leave it at that. Okay, Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Yep, yep, yep.